the skeleton matters, our bones matter, and if our bones are not well protected and uh, well looked after, then the clinical consequences are bad. The functional consequences are bad, you can all appreciate fracture, but the morbidity and mortality associated with hip fracture, for example, whether that's in a postmenopausal osteoporotic patient or in a 35-year-old woman with breast cancer, the consequences are the same, and a significant proportion of those patients with a fracture will die. So it's a pretty bad consequence, and so it's a reason that um, skeletal researchers like myself are very interested in the skeleton. Whether it's a dinosaur bone or a human bone or a mouse bone, they look exactly like that structure on the right. And that structure on the right, you see those beautiful network of, of, of lines, that's the trabecular nature of the skeleton. And so you're thinking, what are you talking about trabecular structure for, Dr. Sir? Well, trabecular structure is just like this. This is the trabecular structure of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I could have put the um, Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge or um, any bridge um, in the world, but these horizontal, vertical and angular structures are the trabecular architecture of this bridge that give it its strength. The reason it doesn't fall over is because those structures support it. The reasons that our skeletons don't collapse all the time is because of that structure, the trabecular structure of our skeletons. And so that's a great advantage for us, but it's also a very rich environment for um, things to go wrong. Small changes in the struts small changes in length or width or connections can alter the strength of that structure and cause it to fail. Exactly the same thing can happen in our skeleton. When tumours, um, can, when tumours progress to bone or arise in bone, they can cause a variety of different phenotypes, we call them or effects. And so the tumour on the very left is an osteosarcoma, a, a bone forming tumour that occurs primarily in children. It's one of the few tumours that cause uh, increases in bone, more bone to be formed. The tumour in the middle is one that we're all familiar with at UAMS, and that's multiple myeloma, and it causes tumour, it's the tumour there causes the bone to um, dissolve. And on the right is um, a tumour from a patient who has breast cancer, but that breast cancer has spread or metastasized to the bone. And so that patient then has um, tumour in their bone, and if you look carefully, um, there's a pathologic fracture here. And that's a consequence of the weakening of the trabecular struts that were in, in that hip that caused it to fracture under the load or the weight of that patient. Just the same as happens in osteoporosis where the bones are weakened and people can't um, withstand their own body weight. And so a small 55, 65-year-old postmenopausal woman, woman can fracture a hip by picking up her grocery bags, etc. So the same sorts of consequences. And it's this breast cancer bone metastasis that we're going to talk a little bit about. When the tumour cell is going to grow in bone, the bone is basically cement with a few cells in it. And for a tumour cell to grow inside the cement, it has to make a hole. And the tumour cell makes a hole by taking advantage of a very unique cell in mammals. That is a cell called an osteoclast or a bone resorbing osteoclast. Resorbs bone, destroys bone. Normally is present in our system. Uh, in our skeleton to make sure that our trabecular struts are kept clean, kept in good shape, etc. Just like the painters on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, they start on New Year's Day painting the bridge and repairing all the cracks and everything. By the time they get to New Year's Eve that year, they've got to start back again. Same thing happens with osteoclasts. They're continually working to make sure that the skeleton is in good shape. And tumour cells take advantage of osteoclasts. And this is a picture of an osteoclast. And the tumour cell takes advantage of the osteoclast by stimulating it, tickling it to resorb bone. And the trail you see behind this osteoclast is where it had breakfast, lunch and dinner as it moved across the bone surface, excavating out a, uh, a trench. And it's in that trench that tumour cells can grow. Tumour cells can't grow on this polished bone surface, but where the osteoclasts have dug their trench, tumour cells can grow. So the tumour cells are really, really good at activating these cells to make this process called bone resorption happen and to happen uncontrollably. How soon can we diagnose breast cancer? We all know that mammography and MRI is a great tool and we can identify small tumours and the, the success rate for um, eradication of early stage one tumours is in the 90th percentile. But there's still a portion of the tumours that are undetectable, even by MRI, mammography and other available techniques. So if it was possible to get earlier and earlier diagnosis, the likelihood is that we would get better, have better opportunities to 
diagnose the disease, to identify the tumour at a smaller stage and therefore make it more susceptible to treatment. The, the adage of you know, early diagnosis equals you know, better survival still holds true. Several years ago uh, in the lab, we acquired some really interesting technology and we started to ask the question that could we detect cancer at um, an early or even a more treatable stage since early detection will enable uh, better treatment strategies. The patients are less, less advanced, the tumour is less spread. Can we identify uh, at an early stage um, cancer? And in fact, is it possible to determine whether or not a patient has cancer, breast cancer in this case, based on a single drop of blood or perhaps a single patient tear? And that's the question that we've been asking um, with um, the folks in the um, Department of Surgery here, Dr. Suzanne Klimberg predominantly, and the answer is surprisingly, perhaps, or optimistically, I think we can. And I'm going to show you, the only pieces of data that I'm going to show you are in the next slide, and they're going to demonstrate that we actually can identify whether a patient has cancer based on a drop of blood or a single tear. The data are shown here um, for patient blood or serum and patient tears. We collect the tears with a, a little um, uh, collection device, a little, um, little tube, um, and you have to use conventional tears. You can't activate the tears. You've got to get normal tears from patients. Patients with cancer have different tears and patients without cancer. We, th we have evidence that patients with breast cancer have different tears and patients with ovarian cancer. And so there's a lot of issues. We, have a, we started a program called Tears for Life associated with this. And the data on the right just shows you in red and blue, red circles and blue squares, the differences between patients with cancer and no cancer based on the analysis of their tears. On the left is a little bit more um, traditional scientific representation of this process that is an example of a single patient that has cancer on the top and a patient without cancer in the middle. And you look at that and you think, oh, it's really scientific and I can't make any sense of it and, you know, what, what the heck. But then, because of the beauty of, of science and the manipulation of data, you can take that funky looking profile and make it look like a barcode. And that's on the bottom two bars, two lines here. And if you look at this, these two lines here, that shows you what we call a barcode. It looks like a barcode at the supermarket and we think it's a barcode that helps define cancer. So you can look along that barcode and see that in this patient with breast cancer, there's lots of proteins that are the same between the cancer patient and a non-cancer patient, as you would expect. The only difference between these patients is some form of a tumour, but there are also proteins that are only expressed in the patient serum. That's really strong evidence that there's a difference between that patient and this patient. We know the difference is the one that has a breast cancer and one doesn't. So we think that this, this barcode is potentially very exciting in the diagnosis of cancer, or not to replace existing methodologies, but to, because that's a very difficult ask of any technology, but perhaps to um, extend what we know from mammograms and MRI and other diagnostic tools. And so if we can use blood or if we can use tears, perhaps there's an opportunity for home diagnosis with tears. You get, take a tear, you run it on a particular stick and you say, oh, like you do for a pregnancy test, it comes up blue, gee, that means something funky about my tears, perhaps. Maybe I should go see my doctor and find out whether or not I've really got a cancer or it's just an aberrant um, assay. It didn't, really, didn't work as well as it did, just like pregnancy tests don't always work. So for us, we think that both of these um, methods represent a new way to think about the diagnosis of cancer and perhaps a new way to think about the diagnosis of the altered activity of the osteoclast when we're talking about bone resorption. We don't have good ways to identify tumours in bone. Perhaps we can find using these approaches ways to identify the activity of the, of the bone cell that's altered because of the tumour. Collectively we think we have a great opportunity here for improving diagnosis uh, and improving our understanding of the processes that are involved when tumours are activated. And that's really the focus of a lot of ongoing work in the laboratory and uh, a lot of grant writing efforts.